I'm Darius McDermott from Fund Calibre, and I'm delighted to have Vince Childers with us today. He's the lead manager on the Cohen and Steers Diversified Real Assets Funds. Vince, good afternoon and welcome. Hey, thank you for having me, Darius. Happy to be here. So this is a fund which has a mixture of assets within it. Um, so maybe you could give us a brief introduction to the fund and what type of assets that actually you do include in your um, real assets fund? Yeah, sure. So I think the main thing to to understand is that we're a real assets manager uh, focused really on the liquid listed exchange traded markets for real assets. Um, as you point out, we we have uh, we take a pretty diversified approach. Um, the way I tend to explain it to people is we have, there are a lot of sectors, industries, and securities that we think make sense uh, as as real assets in that in that liquid space, but. For overall, they can be kind of boiled down into core four core categories of real assets: uh, global real estate securities, so REIT structures where you have them, but owners, operators, developers of commercial real estate uh, globally, uh, exposure to commodity futures uh, in the portfolio, so sort of the here and now of supply and demand in commodities, um, ownership of global natural resource equities, so agribusiness, energy, mining, and the like. And then finally, uh, the global listed infrastructure universe, which really spans a a number of of industries and sectors, everything from kind of communications, midstream energy, utilities, uh, et cetera. And about 90% of our portfolio is really concentrated uh, in those core four real assets. So that is a nice mixture of diversification um, within those different types of assets. But let's pick on uh, real estate to start with. Real estate can cover a wide range of different asset and sub-asset classes itself, from sort of data centers supporting cloud and the growth of AI to care homes or warehouses. What sort of exposure can this fund have and maybe uh, what what areas you're favoring at the moment? Yeah, so I think the short answer is pretty much everything you mentioned is is in there in one way or another. So really what we do, and, and this is true of all of each of those core four categories I mentioned, but in the context of, of real estate, um, our approach is really going to start with something like the FTSE EPRA NARI developed uh, benchmark for real estate. And that uh, gives us a very kind of... Uh, uh, widely diversified industry structure that you know really does span everything from residential industrial retail healthcare uh office uh, and so forth um at the moment uh i guess if i had to say you know we we're probably most underweight in the portfolio office properties and within that it's mostly coastal office um, you know, I think the reasons why, from a fundamental basis, uh, I probably don't need to go into. Um, you know, at some point, of course, you know, we think valuations are, will be likely to kind of catch up with with fundamentals, and uh, in that space, uh, even though it's a small part of the benchmark and even smaller part of our our portfolio, um, is something that you know is undergoing a bit of a transition. We think still merits a, an underweight. Um, we're more positive at the moment on. Uh, for example, uh, data centers, self-storage, um, some things that are typically seen as a little bit more defensive and you know, likely could see a little bit of a bounce uh, if we do start to see uh, central banks uh, lighten up on interest rates. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the data storage is obviously a huge growth area as the demand for whether it's e-commerce or AI, you know, all sorts of different Parts. And, and you can see that being a real growth area. So I'm, I'm not surprised that that's something that, that, that you're overweight on at the moment. Um, maybe we should then touch on infrastructure. It's another big part of the fund. Again, infrastructure is another one of these broad terms with lots of subsectors. Um, maybe you could tell us about the sort of infrastructure assets that you like uh, and uh, generally, and, and again, where the fund may be tilted today. Yeah. So if infrastructure right now uh, versus our benchmark uh, is actually our biggest overweight at the moment. Uh, you know, I would say in general, we like infrastructure broadly just because valuations kind of look uniquely attractive at the moment, um, particularly when we start looking at, at uh, you know, valuations versus, say, global equity indices. Um, yeah. So just to make that a little bit more concrete, 
uh, buyer metrics you know, infrastructure is trading at something like a 7% discount. Uh, just take something like a simple EV to EBITDA figure, something like that. Normally, though, the important point is no, normally and historically, uh, infrastructure is actually traded at a premium more in the sort of 10, 11% range. And so we moved to this kind of discounted valuation uh, situation. And you know, really, for you know, most of the post GFC decade, this is probably the second most attractive valuation period we've seen, uh, really just following COVID and sort of spring of 2020. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah. I think the, the valuation story is there. I also think that one of our bigger macro views is that we're probably going to be looking at something like a decelerating growth environment uh, if, as we look ahead a year or two. And historically, uh, infrastructure has played a bit more defensive role and offered a bit more downside protection, um, leading to relative outperformance when you know growth has kind of slowed. Uh, and then similar to uh, the comments I made about real estate, uh, you know, infrastructure uh, very often will tend to perform well toward the end of rate hiking cycles. And so we can see that that as a potential tailwind or, or a catalyst for, for unlocking the valuation we see. Um, within infrastructure, uh, I'd say we're overweight, probably most overweight midstream uh, energy. So your pipelines, uh, in, in energy transport. Um, and uh, and towers uh, are another overweight for us. Uh, and I think the midstream story is really a story about North American discipline in the uh, in the energy sector, meaning you know uh, reducing capex, deleveraging, focusing on balance sheet repair, and, and free cash flow generation. This is a broad story in sort of the North American. Uh, energy situation that applies to midstream as well. It ends up making uh, making these assets look pretty attractive. And then something like towers, I think, is a more straightforward uh, uh, valuation story as well with uh, with the likelihood of, of getting that interest rate kicker if we turn out to be right. And eventually, uh, you know, we, we start to see uh, rate cuts uh, on the on the horizon. And then maybe then to the last set of um potential assets for this fund, which are commodities, and natural resource equities. Could you tell us a little bit about what, which areas that, that you can invest in there? Because you yeah. did mention futures for commodities um, and natural resource equities. And again, which areas are, are attractive on your metrics today? Yeah, so the first thing I, I would want to do is just be clear that we we draw a distinction between commodity futures exposure, um, uh, you know, so getting a, kind of the economics of actual commodity futures contracts, and this would be akin to something like the Bloomberg Commodity Index for for those who are familiar with diversified commodity indices. But we would draw a distinction between those types of economics and exposures. And then the resource equities. Um, so the resource equities are going to be your your producers of many of those commodities, um, and these are assets that you know are going to be valued and priced uh, with the long term in mind. You can sort of think about it in, in one way as the commodity futures exposure, as I said earlier, sort of gives us the economics of of the immediate term supply and demand. Whereas the resource equities uh, will sort of discount a whole future of expected uh, supply and demand scenarios. And so um, they both do something a little bit unique in the portfolio. Now, the main takeaway in the context of a real assets portfolio, where most investors are going to come to us looking for inflation sensitivity, basically you know, asking the question, if we get some kind of acceleration in inflation rates or inflation surprises to the upside versus expectations, um, you know, do you expect to outperform, say, core stock and bond type exposures? And, and more often than not, it's the exposure to both commodity futures and the natural resource equities that give you the biggest part of the inflation sensitivity in a portfolio like this. So, you know, we, in terms of the, the diversification benefits, I think there's that inflation sensitivity there. And then with commodity futures in general, just because they're not, uh, you know, equities, Unlike everything else we've we've talked about, they typically have a lower correlation, a lower beta to equity indices, and just on average are are much more diversifying to you know the core exposures in it for most investors. So maybe then that leads me nicely into my last question, which is for a retail um, buyer of mutual funds or open ended funds or, or closed ended funds for that matter, how does this lovely mixture of assets fit into? 
an in, end individual's portfolio, what characteristics does it bring as part of an individual's wider portfolio? Yeah, so the way I tend to think about this is that if I look through most investors' portfolios and I look at their asset allocations, um, what usually stands out is that there are kind of there are two two primary exposures in there, right? There's the, they're exposed to an equity risk premium, basically, to, you know, stock. How are how are the global stock markets going to do? And then they're going to be exposed to some kind of uh, fixed income duration type risk premium, basically, what are bonds going to do, right? Yeah. What we see historically is that when you get kind of un, unexpected uh, inflation, uh, inflation surprises, and so forth. Um, you tend to get below average returns out of both stocks and bonds at the same time. They stop diversifying each other as well. I think even you know if, if any of us can kind of remember at this point, 2021, 2022, and, so, and, and, and much of that period, um, we had this kind of stagflationary shock where we saw unexpected inflationary outcomes and sure enough, correlation of stock bond returns jumped, and, and it was correlation, you know, it to the downside. Um, and investors are kind of inherently exposed to that, most investors. And so part of what we're trying to do is offer exposure to assets that actually tend to outperform um, when faced with that type of, of environment. Um, and the idea very simply is that if we can intelligently construct the, this real assets portfolio, the investor can kind of slot it in as a sort of utility player, having a supporting role in a broader asset allocation to kind of modulate that inflation sensitivity of the overall asset allocation from, say, something negative um, to maybe something more neutral, or at least in the direction of neutral. So you're less sensitive at the overall level of the portfolio to inflation shocks and inflation surprises. Um, and you know what the long-term data tells us is that you can you can do this with these types of assets, but also they're diversifying enough just on average over time that they can actually make the whole portfolio more kind of risk return efficient as well. And so there are a number of kind of benefits that can be harvested by you know, thinking about a diversified real asset portfolio again, play in that kind of utility role or supporting role in the asset allocation. Vince, thank you very much. If you'd like more information on the Cohen and Steers Diversified Real Asset Fund, please do visit fundcaliber.com.